So today is August, September. <laughs> September 3rd, <laughs> 2014. And this is Wednesday. The last day. <laughs> okay, so we'll begin with homage to the Buddha three times. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Good morning everybody. Okay, so now we are deep in the world of material phenomena. And so yesterday afternoon we went through the different types of rupa, material phenomena recognized in the Theravada Abhidharma. These are the four primary elements of earth, water, fire, and air which represent the properties, you could say, of solidity, fluidity or liquidness, heat, and motion or vibration. And then there are the 24 types of derivative or secondary material phenomena, the five types of material sensitivity, that's the sensitive substances and the five sense faculties, the four kinds of objective phenomena, since the tactile object is included amongst the primary elements, the sexual determination as male or female, the heart base, the life faculty, nutriment, those are all the, the 18 concrete types of material phenomena. Then there are the 10 non-concrete types, the space element, the two types of communication, whether bodily or verbal, the three types of mutable phenomena, lightness, malleability, and wildiness, and then what are called the characteristics of matter or stages in a material process, production, continuity, decay, and then impermanence, which means destruction, dissolution. Okay, now I'm going to skip over the section called classification of matter, which you can read on your own. And I'm going to move on to the section called the origination of matter. In my edition, this is on page 246. I think it might be, you have a 246 or 47? So, in the Abhidharma system, there are four causes for the origination of matter. So these are given in the text, which says that material phenomena originate in four ways from karma, consciousness, temperature, and nutriment. So that's the general heading. Now the text is going to go into the analysis of which kinds of phenomena originate from which causes. Okay, so here we have karma as a mode of origin. And the text says, the 25 kinds 
of wholesome and unwholesome karma pertaining to the sense sphere and the fine material sphere produce First, I'm going to read the text, you know, it's written in this rather scholastic language, then we'll unpack the meaning. Okay, so, the 25 kinds of wholesome and unwholesome karma pertaining to the sense sphere and the fine material sphere produce in one's own internal continuum volitionally conditioned material phenomena originating from karma, moment by moment, beginning with rebirth linking. And then for an explanation of this, we can turn to the guide. And so the guide here says, Kama refers to volition in past wholesome and unwholesome states of consciousness. And so what are these 25 types of karma that produce material results? So the 25 kinds of karma that produce material phenomena are the volitions of the 12 unwholesome cheetahs. So we have, of the 12 unwholesome, we have <coughs> eight originating from rooted in greed, two rooted in, delu in hatred or aversion, and two rooted in strong delusion. Then we have the eight great wholesome cheetahs. These are the beautiful wholesome cheetahs pertaining to the sense sphere. And then the five fine material wholesome cheetahs. This would be the cheetahs of the five jhanas. And those cheetahs will produce material phenomena in the beings in the fine material realm. Okay, the volitions of the wholesome immaterial sphere cheetahs generate rebirth in the immaterial plane, and so they cannot produce material phenomena originating from kama, because in the immaterial plane <laughs> there's no, ma no material phenomena at all. So these cheetahs, even when one achieves the immaterial jhanas in the human world, those cheetahs, the karma, the wholesome karma of those cheetahs are not going to produce any matter in the immaterial plane. Thank you. Okay, so then now the text gives us somewhat more detail about how karma produces its, res its material phenomena. Karma produces material phenomena at each sub-moment among the three sub-moments of consciousness, arising, presence, and dissolution, starting with the arising sub-moment of the rebirth-linking consciousness. And it continues to do so throughout the course of existence up to the 17th mind moment preceding the death consciousness. This is very precise. Okay, so within a single chitta, as we know, there are these three sub-phases. The phase of arising, phase of presence, phase of dissolution or destruction. So at each of these sub-phases, the volition is present, and that volition is producing or has the potential to produce material phenomena. Okay, now this is the important sentence. The 18 kinds of material phenomena produced by karma. Okay, there are, in a way this is a little bit anticipating what's going to come later. The eight inseparables in the nine groups produced by karma I'll come to this later. The five sensitivities. Okay, the five sensitivities, that is the sensitive substance in the five sense faculties. 
So that sensitive substance by which we're able to see forms with the eyes, hear sounds with the ears, smell with the nose, and so on, those sensitivities are produced by karma. So it's by reason of karma that we've acquired eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and a sensitive body. And throughout our life, it's karma that's continually producing in a continuum, like a flow or a process of constant arising and passing away. It's karma that's continually generating the sensitive matter of the five sense organs. Okay, then the two sex faculties, or sex determination, so whether one is male or female, that is the result of karma. Okay, the life faculty, that is the faculty of vitality that vitalizes the body, that is a result of karma, or that I should say that is produced by karma. The results of karma are only the chittas and chaitasikas. But we say that the matter is produced by karma or an effect of karma. The heart base, or we might even extend this more broadly and say the nervous system by which we're able to, the nervous system which is able to s function as a support for mind and conscious processes. And then space. I think this would be the space in between the groups that are produced by karma. So space, I believe, is said to be produced from all four causes because it's the space in between the groups that arise from the other four causes well, th it's the space in between the groups that arise from the four causes that is said to be produced by each of these causes. Okay, now to see the eight inseparables in the nine groups produced by karma, we have to go to paragraph or section 17. And I have to explain now, anticipating the way material phenomena occur. In the Abhidharma, material phenomena don't occur in isolation, but just as the citta and chaitasikas always occur bound together within, call this a mental group, a me a gr or a sort of constellation of factors that includes consciousness and the associated mental factors, so the material phenomena always occur in groups which are called, in Pali, by the technical word, kalapa. Originally the word kalapa referred to when you have arrows, a bunch of arrows, and what is the sack in which they keep arrows? That's the quiver, right? Okay, so within a quiver there's a bunch of arrows. So you always have the arrows in a group. And so the word kalapa comes to refer to a group or a cluster of material phenomena. And the minimum cluster consists of what are called the eight inseparables. That is, any material phenomenon which we can see most clearly in inanimate matter consists of the eight inseparables. The eight inseparables are the four primaries. Then all matter has some color, even if it's translucent. It has some odor. It 
<laughs> it has some taste. And then it has, in some way, what's called nutritive essence. Even if we wouldn't eat it, like, The ceramic of this cup, material of this cup, of course I wouldn't eat it, but it will have some taste. <laughs> Probably if we ground it up into a powder and put it in our mouth, we would taste it. And it would have some nutritive essence. <laughs> so that is the minimum. Those are called the eight inseparables. Then more complex groups have other factors, other material phenomena added to the eight inseparables. So I'm not going to go into the nine groups right here because I want to move on so that we get to the section on the groups. Then we'll see what the eight groups the nine groups produced by karma are. Okay, now it says of these kinds, the eight faculties, the eight faculties are the five sense faculties, the two sense, uh, two sexual determinations, and the life faculty. So those are the eight faculties, and the heart base arise exclusively from karma. The other nine arise from karma only when they occur in the karma-born groups. Otherwise, they originate from the other causes. So the other nine kinds are the eight inseparables, because those will occur in all the groups, no matter what the cause. And of course, space. Space here is taken to be the space which is separating the kalapas. And so that space will occur in all of the, in between all of the groups. I can't. Where are we reading? I'm in the guide to number 10. Excuse me? It's page 247. H who is asking the question? You were. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's page 247. I just finished the guide to number 10. Okay, now we come to consciousness as a mode of origin. And so the text says, the 75 types of consciousness, excluding the immaterial sphere resultants and the two sets of fivefold sense consciousness, produce material phenomena originating from consciousness, beginning with the first moment of the life continuum, but they do so only at the moment of arising. Okay, so the immaterial sphere resultants, those are the rebirth, bhavanga, death consciousness, of the beings in the immaterial sphere. So those states of consciousness can't produce material phenomena, again, because there's no matter there. And it said the two sets of fivefold sense consciousness, maybe because they're said to be rather weak. Okay, we'll just continue, then I'll give a little elaboration. Okay, the javanas of absorption also uphold the bodily postures. So when a meditator is in absorption, then 
if he's in the, well, usually they'll be in the sitting position, so that jhana consciousness will uphold the body in the sitting position. And then the determining consciousness, the javanas of the sense sphere, and the direct knowledge consciousness, that's the consciousness that responsible for supernormal powers, also produce bodily and vocal intimation. And then the 13 javanas accompanied by joy produce smiling too. Okay, just speaking of in a general way about how consciousness produces material phenomena, I think we could see this very clearly in our ordinary experience. For example, if we get worried about something, then even if the weather is cool, we might start to sweat. If we get mentally excited, then the heart starts to beat more quickly. If we get um, frightened, the body stiffens, and the knees become weak. And then if we feel happy, then we can get a sense of lightness throughout the body. When we feel sad, we get a feeling of heaviness throughout the body. So these, we could say, uh, this is direct personal experience of material phenomena produced by mind. Okay, now the rebirth, co I'm looking into the guide to number 11. The rebirth consciousness does not produce consciousness-born matter because at the moment of rebirth, all the matter that arises, arises through karma. That it's karma that brings the new body, the body of the newborn being into existence. And then it says that the tenfold sense consciousness lacks the power to produce matter, which is a little puzzling since the five-door adverting consciousness should also be very weak, but it apparently produces matter. And then the four immaterial resultants can't do so because in the immaterial plane there's no matter for them to produce. And then according to the commentators, mental phenomena are strongest at the moment of arising and material phenomena are strongest at the moment of presence. So consciousness, it says, therefore produces material phenomena only at the moment of arising when it is strongest, not at the moments of presence and dissolution. I mean, this is a technical point. I can't either defend it or reject it, but it's just what's said. Okay, I already explained how the javanas of absorption will uphold the postures. And then the 13 consciousnesses, 13 cheetahs that produce smiling. Okay, the four cheetahs rooted in greed will produce smiling. You know, when you get something that you want, like somebody wins the lottery, or they get a delicious food, they get some delicious food that they want, then they smile happily. So these would be four cheetahs rooted in greed, accompanied by joy. And then also the four great <coughs> wholesome cheetahs accompanied by joy. And the four functional cheetahs of the arahat accompanied by joy. And then the arahat also has that enigmatic smiling cheetah, which makes him smile at ordinary sense fear phenomena. So we could say that this is, that is the 13th citta. So we have four unwholesome, 
accompanied by joy, four wholesome accompanied by joy, for the arahat, four functional accompanied by joy, and uh, four beautiful functionals accompanied by joy, and the smiling consciousness. So that gives us 13. And then the table 6.2 shows you at a glance how consciousness is a cause of material phenomena. So you can just look at that at your leisure. Okay, now temperature as a mode of origin. So that what's meant by temperature here is the fire element. And now notice that the first two causes, karma and consciousness, are causes of material phenomena only internally in one's own continuum, that is, within the animate matter of one's own body. But now temperature can be a cause of material phenomena both internally, that is, referring to the living, animate body, and externally, that is, in inanimate objects like cups, tables, chairs. So the fire element, which extends over a spectrum from hot to cold, on reaching the stage of presence, where it's more powerful, produces, according to circumstances, both internal and external material phenomena originating from temperature. Okay, so now in the case of a human existence, beginning from the stage of presence at the moment of rebirth linking, the internal fire element found in the material groups born of karma combines with or collaborates with the external fire element and starts producing organic material phenomena originating from temperature. So at the moment of rebirth linking in a human existence, it's said that, I think we'll see this a little bit below, we have three groups, three material clusters come into existence at the very moment of rebirth linking. The three material clusters are the body cluster, which consists of ten material phenomena, the eight inseparables, the life faculty, and the body sensitivity. Then there is the, what is called the sex determination cluster. And this also consists of ten material phenomena. These are the eight inseparables, which are always present in matter. And now since it's a living organism, so the life faculty is there. And then the tenth component is the actual sex determination factor, either XX or XY, male or female. And then the third material cluster is called the heart-based cluster. And you see it's called the heart base, even though now at this point the heart as an organ hasn't even formed. But it's really referring to the material base for mental activity. And so this is also a cluster of ten phenomena the eight inseparables, and since the heart base is alive, it has the life faculty. And then the tenth member is 
the heart-based phenomenon itself. Okay, so these are the 30, there are three groups of 10, so 30 phenomena that come into existence at the moment of rebirth linking. And so at the moment of rebirth linking, they come into existence through karma. But once they come into existence, then the heat element within those three groups, as well as the external heat element, that would be the heat provided by the womb, the mother's womb, that heat starts to contribute to the production of more and more material phenomena. So the internal fire element found in the material groups born of karma combines with the external fire element, that would be the heat of the surrounding environment. They start producing organic material phenomena originating from temperature. Thereafter, the fire element in the material groups born of all four causes produces organic material phenomena born of temperature, produces organic material phenomena born of temperature throughout the course of existence. And then externally, the temperature or the fire element also produces inorganic material phenomena such as climatic and geological transformations. I mean, global warming at a, in a nutshell. So we have you know, the heat of the sun rises and then ice starts to melt. Or if the fire element goes down and it gets cold, then the, water, the moisture in the clouds could turn into snow and then snow starts to fall. So we see that changes in temperature or fluctuations in the fire element are responsible for all sorts of mater uh, material changes in the external world. But we have a rock over a long time. It's heated by the sun, and at a certain point it starts to split and to crack. Okay, then we come to nutriment as a mode of origin. So nutriment, this is what is called oja, nutritive essence, on reaching its stage of presence, produces material phenomena originating from nutriment at the time it is swallowed. Actually, it seems to me that nutriment starts producing material phenomena originating from nutriment, even from the time it's put into the mouth. Let's see what the guide says. Okay, the internal nutritive essence. Now we have to remember that all material phenomena have nutritive essence. And in the food that we eat, if we're eating, I guess, salads, fresh vegetables and fruits, the life faculty is still there. So it still has life faculty, but nothing else. But if the food is cooked, probably there's no longer a life faculty, but just the eight inseparables. But in those eight inseparables, there's the factor of nutritive essence. That is the, those are the constituents that form, that have nutritional value that are going to be absorbed into the body, metabolized and assimilated to the body. Okay, so the internal nutritive es essence supported by the external produces material phenomena at the moment of presence starting from the time it is swallowed. 
So when we swallow food, then the food starts producing new material phenomena and even the nutritive essence of our body is stimulated by the food to start producing more material phenomena. So the material essence that has reached presence in the material, this gets very technical, the nutritive essence that has reached presence in the material groups originating from nutriment produce a further pure octad. A pure octad means the eight basic material phenomena without any other additional factors. And the nutritive essence in that octad originates still a further octad and thus the occurrence of octads links up 10 or 12 times. So when we eat sometimes just a little bit of food, that starts producing, the nutritive essence start producing more material phenomena. <laughs> I guess this is to explain how a little child, <laughs> starting from a baby this big, starts growing bigger, 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 <laughs> until it becomes a six, five foot, six, six foot five adult weighing 200 pounds. Okay, the nutriment taken by a pregnant mother pervades the body of the embryo and originates materiality in the child. And it's said that even nutriment smeared on the body is said to originate materiality. <laughs> I wonder what the empirical basis for that. Oh yeah, it gets absorbed through the skin. Okay, and then the nutritive essence in the internal groups born of the other three causes also originates several occurrences, several processes of pure octads in succession. Okay, then the nutriment taken on one day can support the body for as long as seven days. So if one takes, eats on one day, then one could fast for seven days, probably without undergoing a real serious diminishment of one's bodily substance. But after seven, I, I would think that it differs from one person to another. Maybe, excuse me? Women. Yeah. <laughs> of course, monks are always, who compose these treatises, are always thinking, <laughs> thinking of men. <laughs> okay, then here comes a kind of summary of, by way of the four causes. Okay, the material, this is section 14, the material phenomena of the heart and the eight faculties, we already went through the eight faculties, five sense faculties, two sex faculties, life faculty, are born of karma only. The two means of intimation, bodily intimation, verbal intimation, are born only of consciousness. Sound we didn't take sound in yet, but sound is said to be born of consciousness and temperature. So sound is born from consciousness when we make a determination to speak. So I decide I'm going to say, uncle, and then I say, uncle. So it's the volition of uncle that moves my vocal cords and mouth so that I, I, so that I articulate the word uncle. Philip, what are you doing here? <laughs> okay, and then sound, of course, is produced, we would say, by temperature, by, without any intercession of mind. In the case of a human being, I 
think one would say temperature, <coughs> snoring, would that be temperature? But certainly externally, when the wind blows through the trees, that we would say, and then the trees make a rustling sound, or the water goes flowing over rocks, and then we get a gurgling sound. That, they would say, is sound which is produced by temperature. Okay, then the three modalities of matter, that's ma lightness, malleability, and wildiness, arise from temperature, consciousness, and nutriment, and the inseparable material phenomena, that's the eight inseparables, and the space element arise from all four causes. And then interestingly, it says that the characteristic material phenomena, that is production, continuity, decay, and dissolution, do not arise from any cause. Okay, let's look in the guide, which, okay, it says, articulate sounds are caused by consciousness, inarticulate sounds by temperature. Okay, the three qualities of lightness, malleability, and wildiness arise from favorable climatic conditions. That is, if the weather is good, climate is good, air is good, then our bodies become light, malleable, and wieldy. They also arise from the state of mind. If the mind is joyful and happy, buoyant, then the body feels light and wieldy and also from wholesome nutriment. If we eat good, nutritious food, the body is light and malleable, or as if we stuff ourselves with junk food, you've experienced it in the body, it gets heavy, uh, dull, unworkable. Okay, then the space ele element occurs as the interstices, that is the space in between the material groups born of all four causes. So that's why it's said that the space element is born of all four causes. And then the next section will explain why the characteristics do not arise from any cause. Okay, the summary first, it gives us just the, the, new, the numbers, but I said we don't have to be hung up on the numbers. And anyway, the numbers are explained in the guide. But here comes the explanation why the characteristics are and said to be produced. It is explained that the characteristics of material phenomena are not produced by any modes of origin since their intrinsic nature consists solely in the qualities of being produced, etc. It's a little enigmatic as stated, but since these four stages actually include production, you can't say production is produced by a cause, because if production is produced by a cause, <laughs> it seems that you get into an infinite re re regression. So production is the actual arising of the material phenomena. So the material phenomena arise from four, any of the four causes, but the production is just a word which signifies the coming into being of the material phenomena. So production itself is not produced, rather it's the material phenomena that are produced. And we just use the word production, but we use the word production just to label that event of coming into being. What, what was that? The telephone. Your phone. Oh. Somebody has a telephone? 
Oh, a ringtone. Yeah, please turn the cell phones off. Okay, I want to go into the grouping of material phenomena because that will take us as far as I wanted to go with material phenomena. Okay, so here the text is explaining now we're in section 16. So first it says that there are, it gives the overview that there are 21 material groups which have the, the mark of a material group is that they arise together, all the phenomena arise together, they seize together, they have a common basis, and they occur together. And then the guide explains that material phenomena do not occur singly, but they occur in combinations of groups. So these are called rupa kalapas, or simply kalapas. And then 21 are enumerated. Okay, they have a common base. The common base are the four great essentials, the four primary elements. So all of the other derived material phenomena arise based on the four great elements. And among the four great elements, every group of three arises based on another one, on each one, let me put it this way, each of the four primaries arises based on the other three. So the four great primaries are conditions for each other as well as conditions for the derived material phenomena. And so they all arise together, see, occur together, and seize together. Okay, now we have the groups originating from karma. This is what was referred to in the earlier passage when it said, see section 17. And so here we have the I decad. The word decad means a group of 10. So the I decad consists of the eight inseparables we always have the eight inseparables. Then since the I is living matter, it has the life faculty, and it has the I sensitivity. So within our I, that sensitive matter always exists embedded within an I decad coexisting with the other nine material phenomena. And so similarly, we could form other decads for the ear, nose, tongue, and body. So altogether we have five decads, five groups of ten, which constitute the sense faculties. Then we have, depending on the sex determination, either the female decad or the male decad. And then we have the heart base. So these are five, then taking the two possibilities together, seven and the heart base, eight. So eight decads originating from karma and then there are also inseparable material phenomena, the eight originating together with the life faculty, but without any other material component. So this is called the vital or living nonad. Nonad means a group of nine. So probably throughout a lot of the flesh of the body, the internal organs, the matter, from an Abhidhamic standpoint, consists of the vital nonad. The body decad is only those components of the body which have that sensitivity towards for tactile sensations. 
but like the marrow of the bones. You know, can't feel anything with it. So that's the vital nonad. And so these are the nine groups that originate from karma. Okay, then we have groups originating from consciousness. Okay, so the, we take the pure octad, the group of eight, and together with bodily intimation, <laughs> that is bodily expression, these constitute what is called the bodily intimation nonad, a group of nine involved in expressing or communicating thoughts and feelings through the body. And then together with vocal intimation, which is a kind of material phenomena, and sound, then for vocal intimation, we get a group of ten, not nine, because the phenomenon of sound is added. <laughs> so here we have ten, the basic eight, the inseparable eight, verbal intimation, that is the material phenomena that sort of activates the vocal cords, the mouth, and so on. And then the sound that comes out to express my ideas. So that is a group of ten. Well, here we really start getting into convoluted numbers games. So let's just say that to go through it a bit quickly and not get hung up on numbers, they can go together with the material phenomena of the lightness triad, that is lightness, malleability, and wildiness. The, to form a yundekad, that's a group of 11. Then we have a dodekad, that's a group of 12. So you have the basic eight, I'm losing my counts. Why don't you look at this at your own leisure, okay? <laughs> then we go to the groups originating from temperature. So originating from temperature, we have the pure octad. That's the bare octad. You know, externally, in the external, in the material world, pure octads originate from temperature, purely physical conditions. Then the sound nonad, that is when the wind is blowing through the trees and producing sound, so that sound is coexisting with the eight inseparables. So there we get a group of nine. Then within the body, temperature can cause, you know, a favorable temperature can cause the lightness triad, lightness, malleability, wildiness. So we have the basic eight plus the lightness triad. That makes a yundekad. That's a group of 11. And then if we have sound, then there's a dodekad. That's a group of 12. Oh, well, sound in the lightness triad makes a group of 12. So we have these four originating from temperature. Then groups originating from nutriment. Okay, the pure octad, that is when we eat nutriment, it says that it, it's a little strange, that the pure octad, that's the basic eight, and the yundekad of the lightness triad, that is the pure octad, the pure eight, plus, or the eight, plus lightness, malleability, wildiness, forming 11. Those are the two groups that originate from nutriment. I say this seems strange, since I would think that the muscles of the body, I would think, originate from nutriment, and that would have to be a vit vital nonad, at least. And then I would say that the eye sensitivity, the other groups within the eye, 
the eye decad originate, it seemed to me that they would originate from nutriment. Okay, I can't figure all of this out. Some of it seems a bit questionable to me. But years ago when I was learning to sp spoken Chinese, sometimes I would come to strange sentence constructions and I would ask my teacher at that time, Sharon, Ch why do we why do they say it like this? And her explanation was, Oh, that's the way they say it in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> but why? That's the way they say it. <laughs> so sometimes when it comes to these stipulations in the Abhidharma, I puzzle over why are they saying this? And then I just have to be content with, that's the way they say it in the Abhidharma. <laughs> okay, so that takes us through material phenomena as far as I wanted to go with it. If you want to get the full picture, you could take the sections on the occurrence of phenom material phenomena. But to finish up in time, we just want to bring in, we can't leave the survey of the four fundamental realities of the Abhidhamma without bringing in the aim of the whole teaching, which is the fourth ultimate or fundamental reality, Nibbana. So you remember the four ultimates we've dealt with now, Chitta, mind, chaitasikas, mental factors, rupa, material phenomena, and now we come to the fourth, Nibbana. And the Abhidharma doesn't say very much about Nibbana. Even in the Abhidharma Bhittaka, when they treat Nibbana, it's usually done as a negation of the characteristics of conditioned phenomena. So it's always well, generally uh, approached through what's called the via negativa, that is the negative way, by negating the characteristics of experience, conditioned phenomena. Even in the suttas, the Buddha calls Nibbana a jatang, that which is not born, a bhutang, that which has not come to be, a katang, that which is not made, a sankatang, that which is not conditioned, amatang, the deathless, Now sometimes he uses positive attributes like Paramasukha, ultimate bliss, Paramasanti, ultimate peace, Anuttara, yoga, kemang, supreme security from bondage. And sometimes he uses metaphorical language like Sarana, the refuge, Lena, the cavern, Tana, the protection, the protector. Parayana, the final destination, and so on. Okay, so here, now I'm on page, I have it on page 258. It's section number 30 on Nibbana. And so Nibbana is termed super mundane, here the Pali word is lokutara, which means lokutara comes from loka, means world, and uttara means that which has crossed over the world or that which is beyond the world. So nibbana is super mundane, and it is to be realized by the knowledge of the four paths, that is, the four chittas that constitute the four paths have the special function of penetrating to Nibbana, of directly seeing Nibbana, realizing Nibbana.
And at the moment of the path, the path consciousness takes Nibbana as its object. So every state of consciousness, every citta has an object. Usually our objects are the objects of the five senses or just bare mental phenomena. But with the progression of insight as one sees more and more deeply into the nature of conditioned phenomena, at a certain moment as the path arises, one breaks through the entire net or web of conditioned phenomena and just for that moment of the path one sees the ultimate truth, the supreme truth of Nibbana. And so the path consciousness takes Nibbana as its object. Then immediately after the path there come the two or three moments of fruition of the fruit consciousness at the same level of the path. So it's either the fruit of the stream enterer, fruit of the once returner, fruit of the non-returner, or fruit of arhatship. So that fruition consciousness also experiences Nibbana, experiences the bliss of Nibbana for two or three mind moments as the object. But then a person who has reached one of the fruitions can enter into a meditative absorption of that fruition in which they will experience Nibbana for a continuing period of time. Even if they want to sit continuously for, for an hour, they'll be in meditative absorption, actually experiencing Nibbana for a full hour. If they want to do it for three hours, seven hour, six hours, even a full day, 24 hours, they could spend absorbed in the blissful meditative experience of Nibbana. Okay, then the text here says that Nibbana is so called because it is a departure from craving which is an entanglement. This is a little bit, it's an inaccurate wordplay. It was recognized as the really correct etymological derivation of the word Nibbana comes from near plus the verbal root va. And so we get a verb in Pali, Nibhati or Nibhayati, which means the going out of a fire. So this is the going out or extinguishing of the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion, or the going out of the fire of craving. But the commentaries derive it in a somewhat, I call it a playful derivation, from another verbal root, va, which gives a noun, vana, which means 
a weaving together and then that implies an entanglement or maybe a weaving together in the sense of things that are sewn together so that one life is sewn together to another life. And so vana, the weaving together, is identified with craving because craving is what weaves one life together with another life. And then the prefix near has a negating function. So they take it near to be the negation of the weaving, the negation of this entanglement or the undoing of the entanglement. Disentangling, we could say. It's the disentangling of the entanglement. Okay, so that is what's explained in the guide to number 30. Okay, then we come to the analysis of Nibbana, and then the text says, Nibbana is one-fold according to its own nature. And so the nature of Nibbana is that it's the super-mundane, world-transcending, ultimate reality, that which is essentially unconditioned, unproduced, and so on and so forth. And sometimes it's said that its nature is that of being peace, the ultimate peace or the ultimate bliss. But then it says that with reference to a basis for distinction, Nibbana is spoken of as being twofold. That is, there is the Nibbana element with the residue remaining and the Nibbana element without the residue remaining. The residue is the combination of the five aggregates that constitute our individual existence. And so the element of Nibbana as lived and experienced by the arahant is called the nibbana element with the residue remaining because the arahant has completely eradicated greed, hatred and delusion, uprooted craving and ignorance. And so we could say that the arahant has permanent access to nibbana and even that this extinction of greed, hatred, and delusion in the arhat is the nibbana element with a residue remaining. Okay, and then with the arahats passing away, then there's no more relinking into a new existence. So the chain of birth and death, the continuum of birth and death comes to an end, and then there is what remains only the unconditioned element itself. So that is called the element of Nibbana without a residue remaining. And then in the commentaries, they sometimes refer to these two Nibbana elements as the one with the residue as the extinguishing of the defilements and the one without a residue remaining as the extinguishing of the continuum of the five aggregates. And then Nibbana is said to be threefold according to its qualities, the way it's experienced. That is, it can be experienced, here we have void, or actually the more familiar rendering would be emptiness, as being empty, as being signless, and as being desireless. So Nibbana is empty of any kind of substantial identity. It's empty of all defilements, and it's empty of all conditioned phenomena. It's signless because it doesn't have any of the 
signs or marks or characteristics of conditioned phenomena and it's desireless because with the attainment of Nibbana there's no hankering or desire or craving. Okay, then the verse comes, or this chapter comes to an end with a verse on Nibbana. So it says, Great seers who are free from craving declare that Nibbana is, here it says, an objective state. The Pali word is actually much simpler, paddang. I would cross out objective and just say a state declare that Nibbana is a state which is deathless. This is a chutang, maybe more literal, imperishable. Then we have a chantang, here translated absolutely endless. I don't quite like that. I would go now for a chantang, more has a sense of ultimate. then a sankatang means unconditioned. It's not produced by any causes and conditions. Through practicing the path, one realizes Nibbana, but the path doesn't bring Nibbana into existence. Nibbana is always there. It's just that through the path, one gains access to Nibbana. And then Nibbana is called a nutarang, which means supreme or unsurpassed. And then to sort of sum up the whole exposition of all the ultimate realities which we come to now, the Tathagatas reveal the ultimate realities as fourfold, consciousness, mental factors, matter, and Nibbana. And then if you want to get fully <laughs> acquainted with all of the different aspects of material phenomena. Well, this was a grueling table to produce. On page 262, 263, there is a the comprehensive chart on matter. Okay, I went a little bit longer than expected today because I wanted to finish to finish all the material that I intended to cover. And so now we could take a little break, maybe take a 15 minute break. Then we could come back for a last round of questions and then for a final sharing of the merits for this retreat. Do you want to do a little exercising? Do you feel the need for it? Maybe at this point we don't need it. You just walk around a little. In the afternoon, the